All right. Hi, welcome to Watercolor Wizardry um, on Rainbows and Razor Blades. And today we are finishing the Omalia map. Um, last week we did basic continent shape. We did the wash. Uh, we talked a little bit about drawing mountains and other small areas. We're gonna be finishing up the mountains today. And then we're gonna be spending a lot of time doing hand lettering. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, about um, how to draw like with different fonts and how to use uh, different types of handwriting or different types of or styles of calligraphy when you're working on a map to give it that sort of map-like feel. Um, I believe, oh, usually I have things to plug. I don't think I have a list yet. Oh, here it is. Okay, uh, Kat just sent it. So a few things to plug um, at, 4.30 um, Pacific time, we are going to be doing the first ever episode of Misguided Magic. So we had a couple one-shot prequels, but we have a uh, the start of our campaign happening. I'm very excited about it. I'm hoping to have the finished map scanned for it. We'll see. If not, I might still be looking at the rough draft. Um, and then tomorrow at 6 p.m., we have Chaos Commentary with Kat and Kristen. Uh, Thursday at 5 p.m. we have At the Threshold, which is back from being on break. Friday at 7 p.m. we have Solemn Exteri. Um, and then next week it starts all over again. That's so much programming now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. So I'm grabbing some of this burnt umber, which I believe is what we used before. And I have some mountains here. I want to start by blocking in like the really big landmarks. So we want to make sure we have plenty of room for them. So I think what I'm going to do is block in the Hydra, which is this enormous lake that is part of the reason this whole uh, country is forested. And it starts coming down from some of the mountains over here and it has tiny little branches that move out. I would imagine there's like kind of like a valley here and then a lot of ridges and then this whole thing is built on a valley. Um, and a few different mountains that other fingers of the lake go to. We'll go ahead and move through and just sort of starting off. I think there's another mountain up here, a few other things. We're just going to pull it. It's okay if it starts from a small mountain, as long as there's enough room to fill in all the, the, the different cities that go around it. I want to make sure, because it's kind of in the middle of the Fallen Grotto and Oracle Lake. And I want to make sure that it kind of spreads out because the country is sort of split in half. There is North Gretelman and South Gretelman. And I want to make sure that we start with like a few of the little fingerling lake areas and then slowly move our way to the central lake just to make sure that we get all the different pieces in there so that we can fit everything in that we want. Because I already have a rough draft with a lot of towns and stuff blocked in. I'd like to be able to keep them. And I'm going to use a pipette and just get a little bit of water here. I think this is a little dark, so I'm going to dilute it some so that it doesn't seem as stark as it did. Kind of measuring the distance from some places to other places, moving this in and around. I strongly suggest working with a new nib if you want something that has a very, very fine line to it. Um, so I'm, I want the lettering for Vertohen to be over here for the country, I think because there is a small spot there. There are, it, originally it was written over here, but I think I wanna pull it up because there are a lot more cities down here and I've got a blank spot. So I'm gonna very carefully move around that. Put in a little more ink as I do so. It's okay if it gets a little bit warped, I'm not super worried about that. as long as it's clear that there's a lot of like small parts of the lake that move off. Um, it is called the Hydra because it has so many little branching parts that move off of it. There are no actual Hydras in the lake. I mean, who knows, maybe there are, but it's definitely not known for that. Uh, the idea is that the lake moves across and just sort of feeds this really lush, beautiful green country um, I think it has a mix of jungle and forest. It's mostly forest, but over here, especially since there's swampland uh, on the west, I think this area over here is a lot more marshy. We may get some more jungle plants. 
now that I know that I want Vertohen lettering to be up here, I'm going to pull a few different cities down here. I don't have to have this big blank space. So I'm going to pull a couple extra areas over here because I ended up adding extra cities after the fact because I realized that cities would have sprung up because of the war. But I don't think it makes sense for the cities to spring up if all their supplies had to be imported if there wasn't a fresh supply of water. So I'll pull some of the lakes down here. Um, part of the lake may have been corrupted because the fallen grotto was poisonous. Right. And at this point, I'm getting to the finger lakes over here that are connected to the mountains. So I want to go back in and really pull out where some of these mountains are. Putting this up to the top of the mountain, have a small mountain here. There was a mountain over here. There are a few mountain cities. I want there to be like a tiny little cove here before we get to the port cities. A few mountains, nothing too intimidating. And then there's a ton of life over here in this little cove. So I want to make sure that I allow plenty of space for it, pulling this over and letting this span a really long distance. In general, it doesn't look like this is a very big area right now. But one thing I found is that the more cities you add in, the more you're going to have areas that feel dense. I have a tendency to do kind of big mountains because I like that just symbolically. I think it looks prettier. I don't like a million tiny little mountains. It bothers me. Um, and I don't think it's as pretty. So I, I have kind of big features for my land. Um, but then when I start really labeling in all of these tiny little cities, especially with like a nib pen, so it's really, really small, I'm probably going to be leaning in here to do this because I need glasses and I haven't gotten any of them. <laughs> but once I do that, it's really going to start to look populated because if you look and you see like a hundred cities over here, then you're going to be like, wow, this is a big area. So if your area is not very well populated and you want to do a map that has the indication that it's larger than it actually looks, what you'll need to do if you're not adding a ton of cities is to make all of your landmarks really small so that it feels really big. Um, because if the mountains are this size, you're not really gonna know how big it is until you add all of the lakes or all of the other landmarks or tiny little cities, other things that you know kind of get crammed into places. Um, if it's mostly wilderness and you have a not very populated world, keep everything else smaller. It'll make it feel more vast. What I like to do is on roll 20, I put the map up I make the scale of it really big and I get rid of the grids. And then you just option click on the ruler and I say that uh, the distance of one, which it's not even one square, one foot, I guess, because um, it's a five, five feet equals a square, one foot equals one week of travel. So I just set it up and I scale it to the point where I think it should take, you know, like maybe three weeks to travel from the capital to the next nearest city. And I scale it to that and then everything else works off of that. And if I ever want to replicate that or put a different version of the map up, all I have to do is like look up on roll 20 how many squares it is and then just scale it to that size. Pull them down here. I think at this point when I made this, I was realizing like, wow, these all peter out. There are no lakes. And so I added one lake. So they get a tiny little lake over here but everything else just sort of trails off. Oh, and I think there's a tiny lake over here too. There's like a couple little ones. Right, and then there's a lake over here. So what we're gonna do after this is we're gonna go in with a big brush and we're gonna paint in the water so that you can tell what's a lake and what's a different landmark. I think it's really helpful in general. Um, so I want to make sure that we get all the lakes. There is a really big lake over here. And there are some mountains. We'll go ahead and add those mountains. This is one of the highest peaks in the world. So I want to add like a little swirl of clouds around here. I think in general, if you just have like a few areas that have some unique symbols that feel kind of cool, it helps to make your world feel interesting and fantastical. Give it a cool name. This one is called Sears Spire. 
usually a mafri over here is for sort of mystics and seers because the veil between the worlds is thinner here. Um, and then down here, uh, seers will travel the span of the continent just to go to this spire because it's considered like closest to the northern plains, the plains above ours, which are like the ethereal plane, the air plane, the fire plane, uh, and celestial. Fear planes in this world. And there are planes below it. We have some extra mountains over here. Usually mountains will go in ranges and actually usually they go like north to south um, and they, they're vertical. Um, but it's a fantasy world. You can have crops of mountains or you can have a couple mountains going in different directions as long as you have a general idea of why they're like that um, and why it doesn't follow that architecture. Right. Speaking of interesting symbols, we have these this bitters pass over here, the IDD. Um, and they have these interesting formations that look like uh, rings moving up out of the ground. Um, and that's because the traders are really prominent because these trading caravans span this enormous continent. It's how a lot of things, uh, how a lot of imports happen. Um, and in trade culture, if you're bargaining for something, uh, you go to an auction and you hold up a ring to show how much you can pay for something. So what they do is they check your gold when you first enter, and then they give you a ring that symbolizes how much you are worth. So for example, someone with a yellow ring could bid for anything, but someone with like a, a copper ring could maybe only bid for like lower tier items. So if you hold up a ring because you want something, um, you can't like create a bidding war with money you don't have essentially. Um, and a lot of people who have like a ton of money but don't bring it with them will yet like pre-approve their family has like a ring that is just theirs for the family to use and stuff like that. Um, but uh, to stop people from just sort of pocketing the rings, they're pretty large. So it's a set of four rings um, that are all connected together. I forget what that's called. You know, it's like the brass knuckles that have like, they're, anyway, they're all interconnected. So there's these four like really large mounds here and it's called bitters pass because they look like bitter rings. And then there's like a fifth one over here to sort of represent the thumb. It's nice that I have a spot to talk about these because I feel like this is the sort of thing that players would never know or ask about. Um, well, I don't know, maybe they do. A few of the players are new, I don't know what kind of stuff they would investigate. Um, but I do know none of them are from this immediate area and none of them have any reason to ask about it because it's not a big part of um, the plot that's going on up here, which is where we're starting off. All right, now I just need to see. Okay, we have, I'm gonna do some of the, sort of outskirt landmarks. We have a couple of volcanoes here. This is like a volcanic area. Even if the volcano isn't active, um, the volcano symbol is pretty universal. So you can always draw it as such and then just tell your players, you know, it's a dead volcano. I find that that's easier than just drawing something that looks the way it is. With maps, it's all about representation, not, um, not showing how something is accurately necessarily. I don't know how she would handle a volcano. I feel like not well. I don't think it would end well. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'm, I'm not giving her enough credit. Um, okay, and then we have this really big, there's like a, 
a marshy pass over here and it's sort of interrupted by this super huge long great lake that feeds from the spiral of this mountain. And honestly, there are so many spirals in the mountains. I feel like several mountains would feed into it. So I'm gonna pull that over here. I'm gonna pull some from over here and just say that multiple mountains feed into this. And again, I'm just measuring distance back and forth between the coast and where I want this to come to. Because if I just follow it shape for shape, it's easy to lose track of proportion. And I want to make sure that I don't pull this all the way over to the coast and suddenly the huge, this huge landmark has completely changed the world. Right. I think that's everything but the trees in this area and like the tiny little landmarks for grass, which I'm going to go back and do separately. We do have some little lakes here, a couple little mountains. I, I don't know what the Yeti is, but welcome. And then let's go back while we wait for this to dry before we do this area up here, because I don't want to smudge it. Um, I'm just going to go back and start adding on to this mountain range over here. Try not to have completely straight mountains. You want them to sort of move back and forth a little bit just to give a natural feel to things. I think some of these areas over here. <laughs> sure, they can be by mountains. Um, all right, I, there are some areas where there are fewer mountains, but I kind of like that. I like the idea that they've like slowly picked away at the mountains over time. So like, especially since this island is so close, I feel like over here they've eventually like completely destroyed the mountains. And also there are reasons that like, there's like a tiny village on this tip. Like I feel like it was, has fewer mountains or was just sort of, they were destroyed or mined over time to the point where there isn't much magic left in them. Oh no. <laughs> Got... Okay, we have a mountain range over here that kind of moves through, and this is called uh, the Footprint Pass because um, it's at a higher altitude. So it's one of the few places that gets snow in some areas. You can actually see your footprints. Um, I want to keep that fairly small because it's very hard to pass to this south side of the country, which is why it's been at peace for so long. It does pretty well because it would be very hard to attack, um, except from the coast. They do have a lot of piracy issues. 
I would love at some point to like talk to somebody who has some idea of how the world is put together and how things like this work. And I would love for them to tell me like, how did you do? How did you do with your assumptions? Is this how worlds work? Did you assume correctly? Because like, I just, I want to know. I want to know if this is just me kind of making things up or if like, yes, that makes sense. That would be defensible. If I end, ever end up at a party with like a world geology professor or something, I, I'm going to talk to them and find out. We did just move to a college town, so you never know. But also with COVID, I never leave my house. So there's that. That makes things harder. If your friend does have a PhD in geology, Christian, I would love to just like send them this map and be like, is it right? <laughs> so I have no idea if they would think that was fun or annoying. I feel like it could go either way. Wouldn't want to bug someone. Okay. I guess I have to find someone who's like a real geek about what they do. So now that we have all the mountains in here, we have all the lakes in here, we're gonna start laying down shading. Add a little bit of color to the world. Watercolors. And mix up a nice desaturated blue. We do not want this blue to be super bright. You do not want to use blue straight from the tube. It's going to make it look garish and like a child did it and you will hate yourself. So the key is to make it desaturated. So how do you desaturate something? You mix it with its complement. So what is the complement of blue? Orange. You want to mix a little bit of orange in with your blue and it'll make it desaturated and kind of grayish and old timey. And then you take a wash of that. So a little bit of it, you don't want to use just pure pigment. And then start painting it on your water. It's forever and ever and ever. Okay. Brushes. I'm gonna start mixing the large ones and we'll probably start with the ocean, which is gonna take a long time. So we gotta mix up a bunch of this. All right, now we've got like a nice grayish blue, perfectly map usable. I'm gonna move some of it over here. So we have two containers of it. Add a little bit more blue, it's getting a tad too purpley. That works, okay. Add in a bunch of water. And then with this, uh, I do need to add a ton of water because this needs to stay wet as long as possible so that there aren't any harsh lines in here. So I'm going to start with the smallest point I can find, which is this area against the edge of the map. Since I'm going to crop it, it doesn't matter if I go off the edge over here as long as I stay over here on the edge. So I'm going to start putting this in. This is even a little too dark for me. I like my water to be really, really light. So there's not a huge, huge difference. So I'm just going to continue adding water as I continue, as opposed to adding pigment. I'm only going to drop pigment in occasionally. You just really carefully go up and down that coastline you've created, try and keep everything wet. Um, if you find that something starts to look dry, you just tap some water into it and then continue. Um, this will get harder the farther along you go as you have more areas that are open at a time. 
So it's something you have to do all at once. You can't really do some of it and then come back to it because you're going to end up with these really hard lines where watercolor is dry. And that's not really something you can fix. This is why I love, love, love working with FW ink because it's acrylic. So it doesn't matter that I'm going over something that I've already painted with ink. It's not going to reawaken and it's not going to smudge. Um, it's a flat line. It's going to stay where it is forever. Which can be both a good or a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you made mistakes. Like I made some mistakes over here. That's just going to be part of the math now. But when you're going back over things and you're layering them, it's actually very, very useful. So it's tough because you want a lot of water on your brush, but if you have too much water, you don't have any brush control. So ideally what you want, um, if you have a decent brush, it'll be able to do this. If you don't have a decent brush, good luck. Um, but what you want is for your brush to come to a point. So if your brush is coming to a sharp point, meaning that it is damp, but not wet, um, then that's a decent amount of water and you'll have enough brush control to do fine line work. If your brush makes a sort of bowed end like this, there's too much water on it and you just need to tap that water out somewhere before you try and do anything with fine lines because it's not going to work. It's just going to get sloppy. And it, occasionally I'm going back just sort of tapping water into this area, trying to get it to stay wet. But if it does dry, that's okay because it's a very small area and people probably won't notice too much. And it's also something, if it's that small, you can fix it in Photoshop fairly easily. It's not a huge deal. Um, if it's really big, it can be more of a, a pain to fix in Photoshop. And also, I want the original to look nice. I have a frame for it and everything. Because uh, I've been looking for more art slash wondering what kind of art I want to put up in my office. I have some pieces, but, well, I have my Hermione painting up, but everything else is just my dog. Uh, so I figured I should put some art pieces up and I figured since we're doing this stream game in here, I'll just go ahead and frame that with one of the empty frames I have from when I used to do gallery shows and yeah, it can be some of the art in the background. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I eventually want to do a mural in the back, but I'm going to try and find a place where you can see it while we're on stream. So all of this line need to avoid getting dry too fast. So I'm going in, I'm kind of filling in whatever areas I can, like the side of this island where you're not going to need to pay attention to it too much. Find areas that have like small gaps in them like this, so that if you have to go back and re-wet it and it's dried by mistake, it's not a huge deal. All right, add a tiny little bit of watercolor gun on one of the islands. It's okay, I don't think it's that noticeable. Life is full of mistakes. Not, not in a bad way, just like that's, that's how life works. Okay, I'm dropping some pigment here and then just as quickly add as much water as I can and dilute it. And notice that this pigment was already heavily diluted. There's very little color going on here. Um, light water color kind of evens things out because it tends to, um, the lights tend to dry darker and the darks tend to dry lighter. So I wouldn't be surprised if this looked a little darker than the wet wash when it was finished, which is partially why I'm trying not to get too heavy with it. Um, and I will add a little bit more color for some of the enclosed lake sarks. I want it to be very clear that this is water. And then once we're finished here, we'll go in and we'll do the lakes that are sort of standalones. Um, but I want to make sure that we get as much done on the outside as we can because it's all interconnected. So I'm going to go up to here and then I'm going to stop because that's a very small area and it's a good place to kind of leave it. Um, and then up over here. Um, you always want to make sure that 
it's the tip of your brush that's outlining the detail work. You don't ever want to do an area like this in this direction because the back of your brush is not very good at picking out precise lines. So you either need to turn the paper or turn your brush. The Fallen Grotto opens to the ocean, um, but it's magical and I don't think it's wet on the bottom. It's just sort of like poison. So what I might do is I might kind of bleed in some purple here and kind of go around the mushrooms, but this is a very narrow opening. And I think I can come back to that later. What's more pressing is that I finish this area right now. So it's really important when you're doing stuff like this not to get sidetracked, which I definitely do have a tendency. So I have to lean and remember quite a bit. I'm trying to think of what to do after this one, because I know we were going to go to PC art for the other game, but I'm kind of liking the maps. I'm wondering if maybe we should just do maps for um, the other games as well. We'll see. Or we could do city maps, maybe for some of the small cities. Um, the capital of Vendere, Tircia, is where the main characters are going. So it might be nice to do a map of that. Decide how it's laid out. I've done so many different kinds of city maps. Uh, country maps or continent maps tend to stay kind of the same the way I illustrate them. But city maps change constantly, and it's taken me forever to find a different kind of, like a, the kind of city map that I feel happy with. And it is more rooted in like symbolism instead of drawing out every little uh, neighborhood or anything, which I know some people do, and it looks gorgeous when they do it. Um, it's just not really my vibe. Plus, it takes forever. And I mean, this stuff takes forever too, but it's a different kind of forever. I feel like I'm trying, this is how you like explain time to a toddler in like very vague, non-descriptive, non, uh, non-specific descriptors. Right, and then we're gonna go back around and just sort of fill in this area before going up the side of the coast. I'm gonna flip the paper for that because it's gonna be a lot easier to paint. I'm gonna make sure before you flip the paper that you don't have any big pockets of water that are pooling because if you move it, um, odds are that water is gonna bleed into something else that you didn't want it to bleed into. So you need to make sure that you've got um, like a damp, dry texture going on. Depending on how much time we have, we might do like a here there be monsters or something with a sea monster. But I think the map, because there are so many cities and there's so much lettering to do, is going to be pretty crowded as is. If there are any little gaps, we'll fill it in with that. But it's a pretty exhaustive map. I kind of get on these world building kicks and I just get very excited about stuff and add a lot of things. So plus in um my home game, which is a game that went on for like two and a half years. It's how I know Allison, who plays in the game later today. Um, I had like a continent map or, that I really liked. Uh, and there were only a few cities in each country. And it ended up feeling very, very sparse, um, especially in the countries that were supposed to have big cities. So to explain that, 
I had that teleportation was just widely available. So like, why not? Like, you don't need to have these like trade road areas. Every major city like has a teleportation circle to every major city. And it's like a public service to run them every few days. Um, and it was much more of like a corporate major kind of world. However, this is a very different map with a lot less magic. So I think there just needs to be a whole lot more towns and cities. Things need to be more spread out. Do this did dry, shoot, I forgot about it for a minute. So what you can do is you can go down to the point where it dried and tried to pull it up, but it looks like it's been dry for a minute here. So ideally you just kind of rely that this is a small gap and people aren't really gonna notice that a hard line is gonna form. And if your wash is pretty light, it's going to be a pretty light line. So hopefully it's not really gonna be noticeable. When something's really, really small, like these tiny, tiny, like teardrop islands, um, it's okay if you go over them because nobody's going to notice. It's just such a small landmass, and it's more of a pain to go around them. But with anything significant, like anything where you could potentially read writing or read like a couple little dots or symbols on it, then you do want to be pretty careful. And this is actually a bog. So I'm going to add some green here, kind of a yellowish green. I want to keep it warm. And if you add any really intense greens or just intense colors in general that aren't watered down, it's not going to look good. Um, if you're going for this old timey look, if you're going for a different look, who knows, it might look great. But if you're going for something that looks kind of worn, most of your colors are going to feel sun bleached, uh, meaning that they're going to be desaturated and they're going to be fairly light. We're pretty close to done. I'm going to start pulling this in from the other side. And don't worry about the sides. That's where we're cropping it. You can bleed off the edges. If this is where your paper ends, just have like another piece of paper underneath it to catch any spills because you don't want like water damage on your wood desk or whatever you're using. But aside from that, like you, you know, just go wild, go off the edge, let yourself be messy on the sides that aren't important. 
because it's better than getting kind of close to the edge and then like having a little sliver that isn't painted in um because then you have to crop it out or photoshop it out it's just kind of a pain it doesn't look quite as good okay i think that's all of the outer water areas so looking around yeah, i think that works okay now we're going to go in, we're going to do some of the inner ones. So we just have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six bodies of water. Okay, seven. That is a decent amount. Um, if you want the bodies of water to feel distinct, you can add slightly different shades to them if you want. But in general, I would just keep it very light and not worry too much about making it unique because it's a map. And unless something is really supposed to stand out, in a way that's representational. For example, this is a bog, it has a little bit of green. Um, if it stands out because like, oh, this map, you know, this is the lake where, you know, like this famous war hero lived and I want it to look special, you know, you don't need to know that by looking at a map. Um, you just need to know terrain. So you don't need to put a little bit of different flavor into your map areas, unless there's a reason like terrain wise to do so. Again, it's just my opinion um do your map however you do your map i usually add a little bit more pigment on the interior areas because i really want them to stand out as water so people don't get them confused with other things but you want to keep them light enough that they don't stand out as big dark spots and you're able to easily draw or write over them in case you decide to put like a little hydra symbol in the lake or if you decide to put you know like a, a floating town a lot of like very small sort of fingerly fingerly lake areas i'm trying to keep my brush really pointy and just barely damp as I pull them in. And then if they stay damp, then you can connect a larger puddle to them and it'll sort of self fill. But if the bulk of it is colored in, it's okay if some of it kind of fades out to mostly water, if it's not super dark, they'll get they'll still get the idea that this is a body of water, which is the main point. Remember, it doesn't have to be precise, you just have to get the idea across. I think if this ends up taking a really long time, I'll probably end up doing the calligraphy partially off stream, just so that you don't have to watch me draw like a million town names. Um, but by the end of this, we should have a decent idea of what the map is going to look like. And hopefully it'll give you some ideas for map tips of your own. Um, I'm just taking some purple and mixing it in with the blue. And we're going to go ahead and do that for the Fallen Grotto. Um, and it's still kind of a bluish purple. I'm going to keep it a little lighter than that. And we'll keep the mushrooms uncolored. You don't want to color in everything. But I do think there's like a sort of poisonous haze in here.
okay, there we go, that works. I think those are all the masses of water. I'm just gonna do a quick once over and double check. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so we're all done with that. Um, oh no, there's one here. So once you're finished with the water, um, I like shading my mountains. I think it just gives some extra, you know, an extra sense of dimensionality to things. Um, when I say shading, it just means giving the sense that something is to the left, something is to the right. Um, it makes them look a little bit more 3D. I feel like there's like wax or oil or something over here. Maybe I touched this area too much. Okay, now I think we're good. Um, so shading the mountains is a different matter. And I do this just with the burnt uh, umber ink that we use. I'm not going to be using watercolor for it because I don't think the color of the mountains is super important. Um, I do think it's super important to show that like water is blue because the terrain is different, but with mountains, the terrain is not different. Um, with mountains, the terrain stays the same. The mountains stay the same. The mountains are not supposed to be different colors. Um, the only thing that is changing is whether the mountains have a light side and a dark side. And so that's something that I like to add on to. Some of the mountains like over here are still feeling a little bit wet on the edges where they hit water. So you know what, let's, let's go ahead and we'll just add like a little bit of grassland or something over here while we wait and then in a minute when the rest of the map feels a little bit more dry, we'll go ahead and we'll start adding that. Um, but I think, you know what, we're going to do the same thing that we're going to do for the map, where we're going to take several different things of water. And we're just going to add in like a tiny bit of ink. A little goes a long way. And we're going to make these washes that are just varying degrees of dark. This is pure ink. This is a darker wash. This is a lighter wash. So when I say wash, that just means it's water mixed with ink. This one is this dark. This one is this dark. And the ink itself is that dark. So we're gonna go through and we're just gonna decide how much we want things to stand out and then draw them in accordingly. I absolutely love painting with ink because of this, because if I decide I want to put like a green wash over some of the land in, at some point, like it doesn't matter if I've already done this, it's not going to smudge. All right. And usually for grassland, I just do like three little grassy air things like you would do if you were just sort of imitating like a patch of grass. And you just space them out. It's kind of up to you how frequently you want to do them. The main thing is not to make them really big. You want to keep them as small as possible. And if you want, you can do a map key. I don't really. I think it's kind of self-explanatory. And if players have questions, they can ask about it. But I like keeping this really, really light because there are cities that go over here. And if I eventually want to write something, I want that writing to be really, really clear. And I don't want it to compete with the symbol of whatever terrain is happening over here. So I keep the area as light as possible. I use my lightest wash. I don't go in very dark. And then later on, when I want to draw something that has like a name to it, I'm going to use either my, you know, my pen or my colored ink over here. And it's going to be extremely clear um, what is what. Which is the main goal here. So for example, over here, I'm going to do rolling hills. Again, in like a dark to medium wash, the hills can be a little bit darker than the grass because uh, they're more significant landmarks, I think. That's just how my brain works. If you don't think they're significant, just don't do that. None of these are really rules. It's just sort of like tips on how to get started.
Also some rolling hills over here that are a little bit more like smaller mounds. And there are hills up here. Again, there are cities all throughout this area, so keeping it pretty light. The ink may dry lighter as well. It's already drying pretty light. I tend, I don't know why, but I put like rolling hills and grassland in anywhere that I think is like a, like a affluent sort of, I don't know, uh, rich in resources area. It just seems like a rolling hills and grasslands just seem like happy areas. And I'm like, yeah, they're happy places. They're doing well. So usually that's how I kind of space things up. I'm just making sure I didn't put any landmarks on any of the islands aside from the volcano. It doesn't look like I did. Oh, you know what we need to do is we need to do this magical sandstorm that takes up most of Oberis. Here's the center of it. I'm just going to do a series of dotted lines around here. I think those are all our uh, rolling hills. Let's add a few more areas of grassland. There's some grasslands up in here. And a lot of map making is kind of boring. Like usually at this point, I like turn on the audiobook and zone out while I just sort of pattern things in. I think probably the longest stuff is like dense forests because I do tiny little circles for all of the forests. And I just do them over and over and over and over. Um, and I really like having like large forested areas in my fantasy map. So usually it takes up a decent amount. Like there's this area and this area is all forested. And I don't know how much of that we want to see on stream. Um, I think I'll just do like a little bit of all of it and maybe start labeling. It's been what, an hour? Um, uh, this is for my campaign. I'm sorry, I just saw your chat. So this is for Misguided Magic, which premieres tonight, actually. Um, at, it's going to be 7.30 East Coast time, but 4.30 Pacific time. And it's our first campaign that we are all doing together as a group. Um, but it's called Misguided Magic because uh, in the female DM, but it's also an all-female cast. And we are sort of like a role-play heavy homebrew fantasy group. And we've done a couple one shots so far just to sort of get our toes in the water. But um, our campaign session one is going to be today, which I'm excited about, but I also need to do more session prep for. But I do take commissions via Etsy. Um, and I've done a few maps. I've done one really huge world map kind of in this style. Um, as a commission, the other like big world style maps, I've done two others were illustrated either for campaign settings that I came up with and was running paid games for over at startplaying.games or for books that I've written. Majority of my commissions um, are actually for custom pet portraits. I do watercolor pet portraits and that's where I make the bulk of my commission money. Um, and then I do some uh, custom PC art in watercolor. And those are both more popular than maps. I think probably because maps, I don't know, there are some map making software out there that you can use. And since maps aren't as personal as PCs, I think, 
it's maybe people tend to like be less interested in paying for them. I'm not really sure, but for some reason they're just not as popular. But yeah, if you have any map making questions, let me know. Now we're just adding some scrublands. And you can see it fades, but I don't know how well you can see. It depends on like how big your screen is. But uh, once this dries, it fades to the background pretty quickly. And you just have this sort of faint imprint of whatever the symbol is, which I absolutely love. That's what you get with watered down acrylic ink. Um, and I really, really like using that when I first established things because you can draw and write over it so, so easily and doesn't really compete with anything else. Or tension, which is great if you were planning to have a lot of things that are labeled but are not 100% sure on where you wanna place them. Yeah, um, you could roll it up. I don't think I've ever seen someone roll up an original map, usually because to get this sort of look, you have to use watercolor or some sort of paint. Um, and partially it's gonna be hard on the map if you do that. Um, but what I probably would do if someone wanted to roll one up is I would scan this, I would have it printed on canvas um, and I would add like a sort of roughened background to it. And then I would probably hand razor like the sides of it. So it felt kind of old. And that's something you could roll up pretty easily, especially if you print on canvas, it usually has a waterproof seal on top of it. So you can roll it out and it doesn't get stuff like spilled on it or ruined or anything. Walking around with original art like that is going to destroy it. I'm just going through and finding any areas that have scrub blend in them and drawing them in. We're going to try and cover the whole map with terrain before we label things. I think we're, you know, maybe halfway through. There's some scrub land over here, which I'm realizing there should be more space here. That's okay. And Barry's territory just got cut. No wonder they're so grumpy. Can you use coffee or tea to get the weathered look? Um, you could. I've actually tea stained uh, fabric before and I've done like embroidered art with that and it looks really cool. The thing with tea staining is um, it's very even and unless uh, it's like sort of warped, um, in which case like if some areas warp above the surface of wherever the tea stain is, you're gonna get these dips and valleys of wherever the tea or coffee stain is. So if you do it in like a cookie sheet, like you've seen people do, you have to flip it pretty frequently and you have to continue to push it down so that it wets evenly. Um, and then it's gonna take just a huge amount of time to dry. Um, this is sort of weathered with an ink wash, um, but I don't know why tea or coffee wouldn't work just as well. Um, what I did when I stained fabric is you just boil like a pot like a really, really big pot with, you know, like 10 tea bags. And it, depending on how many tea bags you add and how long you let it steep is just how dark the dye is. Um, and it's been through the washing machine, it worked well. Oh, nice. But yeah, you can use brushes too with tea. I would imagine if you wanted really, really dark lines though, you might wanna go ink, like you might wanna do tea stain on everything and maybe for some of the background areas and then go ink or at least like concentrated watercolor for some of the more precise lines. Otherwise it's gonna be a little hard to read, I think. But for a paper texture, yeah, it is cool. I think it's just, for me, it's more of a process because I already always have paints set up. But if you don't have that and you don't want to invest in like a bunch of ink or watercolor colors, yeah, that can definitely work. And most people have it in their house. Oh, that's cool. You should do like a, a crafting show 
uh, cat. I feel like every time I mention something, cat's like, oh yeah, I made that. <laughs> or I've done that, yeah. Oh, you should. It already has alliteration. Crafting with cat. Cat crafts. Cat craft, maybe? I'm trying to be careful in this area because that's where I want the country name to be, but I don't know. I don't think it's that big a deal if I go over it a little. Um, okay, I'm gonna go in now and I'm gonna start on the trees, which is just a million tiny little circles. And I wanted to keep some trees and more vegetative areas around this lake. So we're gonna do a bunch of that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I've seen those. They look really neat. I would imagine like you'd have to find a certain ratio so that you could physically put minis on top of it for like roll 20 grids. But once you have like the right grid size, then it would be really easy to just like make all your maps so that you can change them around. I've heard that's really cool because you can do like um, animated GIF maps and stuff like that. So the terrain can move while you're playing. Which sounds really neat. Yeah, I don't think I've played in person in like, I haven't DM'd in person in years since pre-COVID. Um, I have played in person because I was in like a mini campaign with um, some close friends, but we ended up still using digital tools. With maps, I suggest picking a symbol for everything. Like I like doing circles for trees. I think they're fast and they're easy as far as trees go. Um, and then just repeat them over and over. I know some people who do triangles, I feel like it takes a tiny bit longer. And when you're doing a bazillion of these, I think circles are just a little easier. But you know, if it's all pine trees and you wanna distinguish between hardwood and pine forests, you can definitely do that. Um, do it a few times on a separate piece of paper first and make sure that you want that sort of time commitment before you commit to doing like a bazillion of them. Usually there's greenery near any freshwater source and there's also often towns. So I usually try and put a decent amount of either scrubland or forest kind of near uh, water areas. And then if you think that the area would have been cleared to make way for a town, then kind of go around the area that you think is gonna be cleared. And you can be pretty loose about it. It doesn't have to be like a clear square or anything. But like I'm leaving kind of an area around it over here. I'm just keeping an air, eye on um, where I want some of the major cities to be. I'm just making sure that I kind of steer clear unless I think that the woods would be sort of integrated with the cities like it is in Drakohan up here. And sometimes I like to just sort of spread out and figure out how far out my forest is going. So I'll kind of dotted line over here and create sort of a general zigzag. Forests aren't usually in straight lines. They sort of 
spread out until they sort of run out of water or they run out of places to go or they get cleared somewhere. So we'll find a general line for this and then we'll continue. It's important you don't pattern your trees in straight lines unless they were planted. It's if it's a deliberate planted forest, I guess that would make sense. But you want to kind of keep them in bunches or groups, keeping it pretty nondescript. Otherwise, it's going to feel a little too mechanical. And I think when we get this close to the coast, we're just not going to have anything because it's going to be a little more barren. Um, try and mix this dot that I messed up in with the rest of the trees. Oh, incarnate, that's cool. Um, I've been using Dungeon Draft, which I really like, but I don't know too much about incarnate. Is that, I've seen like tutorials for them tied together on YouTube names. Is it kind of the same thing? Yeah, I get what you mean. We're like, you want to find a map that's usable, and then like there's something really specific and you just can't. So you have to kind of make stuff work. I do a lot of scenery art for my players, um, just having it up. And I'm always pulling from like tons of different images. And I was really bummed when, um, not when we started streaming, because I'm excited to stream, but I was bummed that we wouldn't be able to just grab things because it's we can't show copyrighted stuff. But I found a bunch of AI generators that do uh, like important locations. So I found having like more representational maps is fine because then I can sort of make AI draw me something that works to have up on screen that feels a little bit more realistic. around trying to figure out where the land masses are. I know there's going to be a ton of trees over here because this is all a swamp area, but they're going to be a little more spread out. And there's a little bit of forest over here. I want to let this area just completely dry before I do this because I don't want to smudge it um, because ink is permanent and once you smudge it you can't really do anything to change that. So you just have to be really really careful. But on the flip side you can also paint over it and do washes and other things on top of it when you're finished and it looks completely fine because it's permanent. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like Illustrator is good for like logo designs and stuff, but if you want to do maps, I, I feel like you would like the map software that we use, the Dungeon Draft one. If you if you wanted to try it, I'd be happy to give you a tutorial cap, but like it's so much easier. It's going to take you so much less time. And you can get a sci-fi vibe with things because you can change the color of all the, st the stuff. And I think you can buy expansion packs for stuff. I would imagine you can. So maybe they have some sci-fi packs or something. But um, I would imagine Illustrator takes a long time. I just realizing that we left out a tiny bit of water over here. Okay. 
I'm like paranoid because I can feel that the paper is wet and I know that it's just the water area. Um, and it's not going to smudge anything, but I, I still feel like, oh no, it's going to smudge. So I'm sure if I tried to draw something on the water now, it would bleed a little bit. And I'm so careful about smudging because I work with ink and that's not really something you can undo. Whereas, I mean, you can't really undo it with watercolor, but watercolor is a lot more forgiving. You can kind of smudge it and fake it. You can't make things more crisp, but you can kind of blend things in if there's like a weird line somewhere, whereas with ink, you can't do that. I'm just going to block out where there are not trees. Because Fendere has, not Fendere, Vertogen has just like so, so many trees. It's going to be like impossible to, I guess, just draw like a line where to follow them because they're everywhere. But I think they've fallen off a little bit more by the Fallen Grotto because. There's just so much military activity there. I would imagine a lot of it was cut down for bases, for camps, just poisoned, burned, et cetera, being part of the war effort. We'll keep it kind of sparse right around the edge there. But the rest of the country should be pretty forested. My dog is barking at a squirrel. I'm not sure if you can hear him or not, but he's going ape shit. We put um, a bird feeder right out front to entertain the cats. And the birds do entertain the cats. Like I have seen them watching the birds sometimes, but the dog is like a thousand percent more entertained by the squirrels that try and get onto the feeder. And he just consistently flips out. He goes nuts for squirrels. And right now I can't let him out to chase squirrels, which he would dearly love because uh, the yard is just open. I don't want him to run off into the street or anything. Um, but we're planning to eventually put a fence there and mostly for him so that he can chase squirrels. He's very spoiled. Usually around coastlines, trees will also drop off just because the area gets sandier. It's like a, a beachy area. So you don't want to go all the way to the edge of the coast. You just want to go like a tiny bit inland. For Tohen, uh, their architecture is a lot more linked to the trees. So I want to make sure that we don't have areas where we're kind of going around things. The trees are sort of encouraged to grow. So aside from the coast, it's going to be pretty much covered in trees. And you don't have to completely cover it, you know, and you don't have to draw all of the circles. Some of them can be dots. You can kind of play around with it. You can have a couple areas where there are clearings. Don't worry too much about it as long as in general you're covering the area. Um, and this is fresh water, so the trees aren't going to shy away from it so much. Oh no, I'm sorry, Kat. I know you have a ton of dogs too. Do they, are they like a, a series of sort of reactive alarm bells where like if one goes off, all of them suddenly, like they're like, the pack is in danger. 
I know I grew up with two dogs and they would do that with each other. Whereas one wouldn't be barking. And then if the other one barked at something, the other one would flip out and was like, oh no, I missed it. It's my job. It's my job to bark. Yep. Yeah, we've thought about getting another dog, but I think my dog would be jealous because he's a huge baby. And the few times we've pet sat, he's gotten really jealous. I pay attention to other dogs. Um, my mom's dog comes over like once a week. His name is Uncle Bean. Um, I mean, his name is Bean. We, we call him Uncle Bean because he's our dog's uncle. Um, so we call him Uncle Bean and Uncle Bean will come over. And if I spend too much attention with Uncle on Uncle Bean, um, Oberon will like, get really possessive and like crawl on top of me to the point where like he's 70 pounds but he thinks he's a lap dog but he's usually not super affectionate like I'll, I'll tell him to like come sit with me and he will but he will like deliberately crawl on top of me in order to get attention if I am not giving him attention I'm giving Uncle Bean attention We're halfway there. We're just gonna come around this side. I feel like there should probably be some trees up north too because there are just so many lakes and I don't know why there wouldn't be. Maybe it's a little colder, but there's still trees in cold areas, so. And it's definitely not like, you know, the Arctic or anything. Maybe there's like a ground crop that has like a really wide root span. So it's really difficult to grow trees because the roots are so thick. Like maybe there's a variety of like tuber potato or something like that that just covers the ground. Um, and it's pretty and you can use it and it's easy to grow. Maybe it has a bunch of uses. So maybe there just aren't that many trees there because that crop has sort of taken over and it's invasive, but it doesn't do really well in moist climate. So maybe we'll only put, cause then that would make sense why it doesn't bleed into Vertilhin because Vertilhin is very moist and wet. So maybe we'll put trees around the bodies of water and then the other areas will be fairly flat because even though there's a fair amount of rainfall, um, the trees just can't take hold and expand. Okay, this is looking good. I'm liking this so far. Oh, and there's some towns by the lake too. It could be the cleared some areas, especially if they were farming this crop. We'll just do some like sort of sparse trees to show that there are some scattered forests, but nothing super dense, nothing like Bertilhen. And usually just because of the way you're drawing, like some areas will appear thicker than others, like this seems denser than this area, which is fine. Um, Oftentimes, countries are like that in general. So don't worry too much about it. Just kind of let it be. I think it looks more natural 
if it's varied. Um, if it's just completely uniform all the time, it looks a little weird. If you have mistakes and you have some dense areas that you're drawing in, you can always kind of draw over those mistakes there. Again, I'm remembering, don't want to get too close to the grotto. So, a lot of these trees are really ancient, though. It'd be kind of cool if there were like a ton of like dead sort of poison trees that were by the grotto. Were just sort of like impossibly huge and they're so big that they hadn't really been knocked down you know they were dead kind of like that is sort of a creepy look So after that, we just have the marsh to do, and then I think we'll be done with all of the terrain. I'm sorry, it's not more exciting making this. You know, just drawing a million circles might be kind of boring to watch. Um, but whatever, if you watch this afterwards, you can fast forward this part. Maybe we can put timestamps on it or something. But you know when to look. I think that's all the forest here. It's all the forest here and here. I might want to add a little bit more density around here. And then I think there would probably be like a few tree areas over here just by the water. Keep it pretty sparse. But there would be something in three lows. It's meant to be kind of like a, a paradise for a pirate retirement, so give it some sense of nature. Okay, so blocking this out, here's where the marsh is. So, of course, marshes attract lots of trees. Going from here all the way up, sort of moving around this footprint pass. It's going to be drawing the outline of where the trees are going to be. So this is the area we need to fill in. So again, I'm going to flip this around just because it's going to be easier to draw left to right than it is right to left because I don't want to worry about 
smudging anything. I'm just going to start filling stuff in. Yeah, happy little trees. Hello, Kristen. How are you doing? I'm excited for our game tonight. I don't think I'm going to have everything labeled by then, so I'll probably end the stream today with like finishing the terrain and starting on names and then I'll probably label the rest of it kind of on my own time because it's going to take forever um and I need to have this other map right next to me but probably by session two this will be up and we'll have this as like one of the main images for the campaign I was really excited because there's this um AI generator and I got it to generate like these really cool looking monsters for the campaign. Um, but then it turns out that like you can only use it for what 10 minutes or something and then it's like okay you figured out how cool this is now you have to pay for it. Um, which was sad because I don't want to pay for it, but I have about 10 minutes worth of cool AI generated monsters and according to their licensing, you can use this stuff in whatever you want. Um, so I'm very excited for that. I'll try and use them this season and then who knows if we're making money streaming, maybe we can pay for a subscription or something. I don't know, but it was cool. Um, I'll have to show it to you. Nice. Are you, um, are you dressing up for the season premiere? Are you wearing purple? I love seeing all of your different like uh, low-key cosplays in the different streams. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah, I was looking. I have a couple of DM shirts. Um, I have one that says Carpe DM, and then I have one that says Dungeon Meowster, and it's got a bunch of cats on it. But also, this is all you're seeing for the stream, and it has like the text down here, so <laughs> no one will know. No one will know if I wear my D and D shirt. But also, I'm not as good at dressing up as you, so maybe that's fine. If we do like, because we're, it's going to be like a political heavy season. If we do any fancy parties or something, maybe we can dress up and like wear fancy hats or something, or I'll get a, a monocle. <laughs> And I'm realizing that the Galarose Islands in the thumbnail don't have any trees on them, but there are a lot of trees in the islands. So I want to make sure that I start adding things there. Go ahead and start over here while we're at it. I get the sense that it's like a dense sort of like forested island area, it's sort of like tropical paradise style Hawaii vibes. Um, and like little cities carved out. Maybe this area is more jungle. That makes more sense because it's by a swamp. And there's so many trees and there's so much land here. Yay. 
Yeah. Well, I guess you were up here. I think you're from over here, probably, like one of these. All right, that's most of it. And then there are a couple islands. Okay, the Pyrenees Islands are agricultural islands. And so we're gonna add like a bunch of forested areas over here, but I'm gonna add them in really particular rows because it's all deliberately planted and it's very heavily cultivated. This is where a lot of like the really beautiful tropical foods come from. They're experts in sort of like drying things. If you get really expensive rations, they might have like, dried um, fruits, vegetables, et cetera, from here. There are a lot of tea plants made here. Right. Oh, it was, um, okay, so you were here, you spent some time here, then you came to the mainland here. This is where you met Beetle. You guys traveled all the way over here, all the way over here. You guys traveled probably for like months and months. Coming up here, this is where the one shot was, uh, the first one shot was, and then Tibby took you guys over here, and this is about where the capital is, and then from the capital, you're going to be teleported over here. Yeah, I, you guys, I would imagine had been together for like a couple of years, maybe. I don't know timeline wise, but like, damn, if you guys walked all this way, that's like half the continent, basically. My hands are getting cramped. All right, let's just double check, make sure there are no extra areas we need to paint in. I'm just referencing with my rough draft that I have. I think we're good. Okay, great. So here's the continent uh, without anything in it. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm, this is still a pretty good nib. I'll probably use it for drawing later, but because the lines for pen, like penciling everything else in are so precise, I'm going to switch this out for a, a new nib. Um, give me one second. Um, This is my last one, actually. I need to order more. But it's just insane the difference makes when you have a new nib. OK. So usually what we do is we will draw out the continents first, uh, label those, and then put the cities around them, because the continent is very important. Um, and sort of the mountains, the coastline, stuff like that. So I think what I'll probably do, let me put this away, actually. Maybe it makes sense to just use the pen. I'm gonna lay in all of the different continents and other significant landmarks, like the coasts, the islands. And I think we're gonna stop there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna do the exact same thing with text, uh, but with a pen nib. And I'm gonna go in and do the tiny towns. 
and the capitals and everything. Usually what I'll do is I'll take much darker ink like sepia as opposed to burnt umber. So this one is sort of this one. And then I'll take a dot and I'll, the dot will be over the, uh, the town is and I'll write it out super small. And then if I want that area to be a capital, I just do a tiny little star. And it's very, very easy and sort of nondescript. Another thing I do sometimes is I use these point zero zero five brown micron pens and you can see how tiny the line is over here it's actually very easy to get really precise line and the nice thing about microns is the ink is waterproof and it flows really really well so i'll probably do either that or i'll do the ink depending on what is showing up best unfortunately they don't have a darker brown which would be perfect because i wouldn't want to use black because it just feels too harsh so what I really like doing is this burgundy pen. This is a Papermate Flare Medium. Um, and it's just one size. It's kind of a crappy pen. It's not waterproof, but I love the color. And it's a lot easier than kind of mixing my own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the font. Um, not necessarily font. I'm going to just look up like Lord of the Rings text. And I'm just gonna sort of pull my alphabet from like Lord of the Rings maps and stuff. Um, I love the fonts that they use. I think it like there's, a, if you look for Lord of the Rings font, um, you get like a ton of them. So, you know, you don't have to copy one font and you don't have to use like the same wording for everything or the same lettering for anything, but just find some that you like, pull from what you like, have some areas that are, you know, like, uh, the A's are drawn one way uh, from one alphabet and then have one where, you know, like the H's are drawn another way from a different alphabet. Like, let yourself kind of have fun with it. Um, that's what I do. I kind of like, I like giving like really long sort of tails to my R's and N's and M's and stuff like that. Um, so Amafri is the first one we're going to do. That's over here. Um, I don't think I'm going to put Amalia because it would have been up here and the map would have to be big for that. I could put it here, but that would be too cramped, I think. So you just need to find an area that's good for it. Um, still keep it fairly small. Okay. And make sure you're spelling your own country right. Uh, and it's always so like anxiety inducing to like write directly on your map. At least for me, it's a lot easier to draw. But I like this sort of chiseled A. And then once you set a size for this, try and imitate that size for all the continents. Usually your capital can be larger than your other letters, but you wanna keep things more or less the same size. Uh, doing these sort of like curly swishes on my H's. R -E -D. And sort of like swishy lines on the F's. And eventually you'll just sort of like come up with your own style. You can use that. I'm not afraid. Um, I'm wishing the AMAH was a little smaller, but that's okay. Your tohin is going to be over here. Um, it's got a tiny bit of serif, I guess, because I'm doing the V like this, but mostly it's sand. Um, I don't know. It's like a weird combination of things that I like, but it kind of works. I find that like if you pull the edges out, so they feel kind of spidery, like on the H's and the R's, it gives that old tiny feel to things.
and compared to this size uh, for the countries, you want to make the cities tiny, tiny, tiny. Like you're barely going to be able to see them. You're going to zoom in to look at them. Um, but in general, that's kind of what I do. Um, Ferris. And that way, when you look at this, you're going to see the countries first, then you're going to see the cities, then you're going to see like the sort of patterned background that's in this light ink wash. Um, it's called giving a first, second, and third read. If all of your words are the same color or the same size, it's not going to look different enough to really be distinguishable. So you want to have some sort of hierarchy to what you're doing. Otherwise, it's not going to feel like, um, it, it's going to feel a little too dense. It's going to be harder to read. Okay. And then Bendere, put over here, kind of in the middle. Bendere ended up losing a little bit of land when I did the final version. So I'm going to try not to encroach on any of the cities I still want to put here. But it's such a huge map, honestly, on the large scale of things, I don't think it matters a whole lot. Then we'll have, I'm going to try and move left to right. So before we get too far away from here, let's turn this sideways. And we're going to do the modeled coast. And if you have like a, a significant line like this, where the coast is going to move in and then out, try and let the text kind of follow it. For example, like Oberis, there's the swirling sandstorm. I try to get it to follow the swirl a little bit. It's up to you if you want to do coastlines or other significant areas in like larger or smaller. I find for the sake of like orienting yourself, uh, big like sort of noted land masses or coastlines, I like pulling them out.
Right. It's up to you if you want to do it vertically or sideways. I kind of like doing them sideways. And then we have the Vermilion Coast up here. One important thing with lettering is if you decide to do like a C a certain way one time, you don't have to do it the same as like the alphabet you're looking at or the reference you're looking at, but you have to do it the same way on your map every single time. Otherwise, it's going to look really eclectic um, and like, you know, different map makers did it. It's not going to feel consistent. Um, and while your world may be eclectic, the way your world is drawn needs to feel consistent so that people can see it and understand it. Oh, coast, Vermilion Coast, and Dairy. Let's do Freelos next. We have Asunas Kabasque, the Galaros Isles, the Speckled Isles, and the Pyrenees Islands. Um, we're going to try and do that in the next 10 minutes, and we'll probably stop here with the, this labeling. Um, the Galaros Islands are up here. So if you have a longer name, make sure you allow enough space for it, especially if it's going to cut off on the bottom where you cannot add extra text. Okay, we have the Sunus, which is sort of like half marsh, half party country, and it's weirdly divided.
I feel like with how sort of anywhere the wind blows, um, Scoria seems to be, I feel like she was like, I'm going to go to as soon as, and then like, she took a boat over there and ended up in swamp country and was like, this is not the party place I was told about. Oh, hello, Lila. So move you down here. Not time for cats right now. nice thing about fantasy maps is if you spell something a little differently that's just how it's spelled from now on it's not like it's a real place that needs to be spelled a certain way um i'm not misspelling my own city uh but i do know that in my rough draft i decided to add an h here and it's like weirdly penciled in <laughs> there's like an arrow for the letter h on my rough draft I need to sort of pull this up so I can see it. There we go. And over here we have Morabla, which I don't know, I don't even have enough room to really give it its own name. And it's so small because the speckled aisles need to move along here. I think I'm just going to kind of leave it as is and then do it in like ink. Same with the coin islands, um, that can be ink. If it's like a smaller landmark and it's not super important, it can kind of go either way. The Pyrenees Islands can be over here off to the right. That has a little bit more space, thankfully.
Okay. There we go. Uh, I think those are all the continents. This is the start of the map. Uh, tune in next week to Misguided Magic, and you should be able to see the finished map up on screen um, as we start, along with all of the cities will be zoomed in on this area, because this is where the bulk of the first season is taking place, uh, unless the players do something very unexpected. Um, and thank you so much for watching. I'm going to go ahead and just replug a couple of things before we end. Um, so at 4.30, tune in uh, Pacific time. Tune in for Misguided Magic episode one. Tomorrow at 6 p.m. we have Chaos Commentary with Kat and Chris. Thursday at 5 p.m. we have At the Threshold. Friday at 7 p.m. we have Solemn Exterior. I think that's all we got. And then tune in next week to watch everything again.